Okay, earth science, Tim, here we go. We're going to talk today about basics of plate tectonics. There's a pink light on the board, so that should help. Plate tectonics. Are you going to record this? I'm, I'm talking to you young people in the audience, not the device that is actually recording this. We're talking today about plate tectonics. Whose idea is this initially? I mean, for one thing, it is a physical truth of at least this part of the universe. And so it wasn't anyone's idea necessarily. I mean, I shouldn't have said that probably, but it doesn't necessarily have to be anyone's idea, the, the, the function of it. But who was the first discoverer, we could say, or the hypothesizer of the principles of plate tectonics as they were expressed, as we express them now? Alfred Wegener. Alfred Wegener. And I kind of um, romanticize or even mythicize his life in that I often say things like his hypothesis, while today we know it was correct, was never accepted in his lifetime, which is more or less true, and that he was ridiculed by the scientific community, which is more or less true. But wh where, uh, whence cometh his original idea of plate tectonics? At least so goes the story. Where did it come from? Yeah, he, he thought, really, and this is, this is going to be a characterization and not necessarily the whole truth, or certainly not the whole truth and not, not necessarily even part of the truth, but we could characterize it as he would look at the planet Earth, a map of planet Earth. He, I mean, technically he looked at planet Earth in that all of this is part of planet Earth, but he looked at a map of planet Earth and thought, kind of, wouldn't it be neat if all of these, since they kind of look like they fit together, actually had fit together? That was the origin of his hypothesis, um, was that they, they, they look like, so his, is that evidence? I mean, you, you could make the case that it's pretty sketchy evidence, but no, it's not, it's not scientific evidence. Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was the impetus of his idea, so it, it was useful, but it wasn't hard evidence in the way that we normally think of scientific evidence. They do fit together, though. What are some other pieces of evidence that he used? Some, some of his realistic evidence that he used. Was it like formations that were formed? You mean rock formations, probably. Yeah. So yeah, there were rock formations. The, I don't know if this is the one he used, but the classic example of this is that there are um, these mountains, and I didn't even draw the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland up here, but there are these mountains in Northern Scotland called the Caledonia Mountains, which I've kind of indicated here. Boink. And they have similar, if not identical, rocks to the Appalachian Mountains in the Eastern United States of America. And so these rock formations that were found with an ocean between them, but had been, evidence suggests, formed in the exact same environment shows that there had to have been some movement. It's a, and this gets to the physical principle that we talk about in physical science and in physics, where how do we know something has moved? I mean, really, like, if you're older than the age of, like, six months, if you close your eyes, if I were to close my eyes right now and when I open them, Marissa is not there anymore, but instead she's over there, I would think, I would assume, I would almost instinctually know that she had moved. You know, when you're younger than six months old, when you're a little baby, you close your eyes and you open them and she's not there. Oh, she stopped existing. There's an there's a idea of object permanence. But we have this almost instinctual understanding that when something has changed position, it has moved. Uh, this evidence suggests this has changed position. It's the same thing. As much as, as much as anything is the same thing when it's torn in half, it is still the same thing. Look at this. Watch this. This is a demonstration. Is this still the test? Yeah, I mean, it's two halves of a whole test, and no matter how far I move them apart, they're still the same thing. If I find this in Scotland and this in North America, it suggests that movement has occurred. Why was that not just immediately accepted? I mean, I made it sound like almost like an idiot. I literally said a six-month-old. I make it sound like an idiot could, could observe that that is the case. Why was that not immediately accepted? Because what was the reigning, you're right, what was the reigning idea? What was the currently, the contemporarily correct idea of Earth's surface? 
but it doesn't move. Yeah, it's, it's this we can see as true. We can see now that this is evidence that this is the way things are. But it's also objectively and borderline obviously true from a human, from a single individual human standpoint that the earth is not moving. You know, like I'm standing here, it's not wiggling around, so it's not moving. The earth is immovable. It's a much easier thing, it's a much more basic understanding to be able to, to see that the earth is immovable. We all compare our emotion. If I ask you how fast that car going down the highway is going, you would say, just if I, like, if this was not an earth science class and I wasn't trying to make a point, I just ask you, how fast is that car going? You would say, 50, 50 miles per hour. You don't say 50 miles per hour as compared to Earth's surface, even though that's what you have to be doing. Imagine if we had a universe where all that was in it was a car. It wouldn't even make sense at all. Like if it was just blank, void, nothingness, and it was just a car moving, moving 50 miles per hour, that's meaningless. It has no, there's no reference point. It could be moving a million miles per hour, and it wouldn't have, that, that has no meaning. If there were two cars, and now they're moving towards each other at 50 miles per hour, now that motion has meaning. All motion is relative. And so, because we had always, and we still do, use Earth's surface as a comparison for, this is the thing I'm comparing my motion to, it itself has to be considered immovable. And so it, this flew in the face of common sense at the time. But there were rock formation evidence. What other evidence was, uh, was suggested by Wegener that we now even know to be true? There was fossil evidence. He found the same fossils here in South Africa and here in South America. Glossoptera, I think. I might be pronouncing it wrong. Glossopteron, maybe. But it was some uh, leafy plant fossil that was found identically in those two locations. And of course, if his initial hypothesis about all the continents having been one at one time, that would stand to reason. And you see the predictive power of his hypothesis. Imagine, I'm not saying this is necessarily the way it was in real life, but imagine he had thought of this idea of the, plant, the, the plants, the continents fitting together, and then later found the evidence that these fossils are as if the continents had fit together. Well, that's predictive power. If his prediction is the continents fit together, and I will find evidence that suggests the continents fit together, and then he does, well, that does not prove a theory, but it adds credence. It lends credibility to a theory. And then what is the last piece of evidence? You may, I don't remember even if this is in the unit you read about, but we have this idea of climatic evidence where we have climate trends that we can see, obviously not now, but we can see evidence from the past of the climate having been similar. For instance, we might find, uh, I forgot to draw Antarctica too, but we might find some, I don't know, little seashell fossil in Antarctica that would not, of, of a type of organism that wouldn't survive there today. Or you can even think of it this way. We find a little snail fossil. My first fossil I ever found was a snail fossil up here in northwestern Nebraska of a marine snail. It's, it's, it has the same morphology as modern day marine snails. And so we assume, relatively safely, that it was a marine snail, that it lived in an ocean. Well, northwest Nebraska is not an ocean now. And so that's climatic evidence. that The climate had to have changed vastly. And that, that lends credence to the fact that maybe the polar surface changed vastly. And in, in, what, in what way does the whole Earth's surface change? How does, this, how does this actually function? So this is the evidence for the theory initially. Explain now in more detail to me what is the theory of plate tectonics? What is it actually at its core? What is it at its core? That's kind of funny. At its core, what is the, the theory of plate tectonics telling us? Yeah, the, the tectonic plates, which the whole Earth's surface is divided up into some number. This is not necessarily meant to be accurate, but the whole Earth's surface is divided up into tectonic plates. By the way, the word tectonic has the same root word as architect. The, 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 Latin, the Latin word uh, tectus is to build. Um, so these are the plates that build up Earth's surface. All, all, all of Earth's surface is built out of. And there are these tectonic plates that move relative to each other. And why do they move? Well, if we look at this in cross-section, we did this yesterday, but I'll do it on video again. If we look at this in cross-section, what have I just drawn here? This is going to be the cross-section of Earth. We'll say this is the core 
and that's including both the inner and outer core. What is, a, what is this red line? Just the line itself. What have I drawn there? The crust. crust. This is the crust. Now then, what is all this between the crust and the core? All this is the mantle. mantle. And this is the very basic understanding of the interior of Earth that we taught from when we're in elementary school. Now let's complicate it a little bit. The mantle is actually divided, and this is not meant to be to scale, but this green line divides the mantle between what we call the lithospheric mantle with the root word from Greek what? Lithos meaning? Remember, it's the same root word as a lithify, to make into lith lith no lithification yeah but lithification is to make into lith and this is the lithosphere the sphere made of lith and lith here lithos is n more specific rock stone yeah so the lithospheric mantle that mantle what behaves like stone what behaves as a solid and this is the asthenospheric mantle asthenospheric mantle and the asthenosphere is from the le greek word asthenos which is weak and it means like physically weak, like, you know, a man who can't lift up a cow or whatever is asthenos. Um, but it means here materially weak in that it will move. It has some, some liquidity or mobility to it. So we now have the asthenospheric mantle and the lithospheric mantle. And so we call this layer, I tried to make this a different color and it isn't. This layer we call the asthenosphere. And then these two things together, the lithosphere or sorry, the crust and the upper part of the mantle together we call the lithosphere. And remember, the lithosphere, not just the crust, but the lithosphere is divided into these plates, with it, which in this diagram are, I'm going to show with just lines through the lithosphere. So both the crust and, I'm trying to make sure the crust is included, the crust and the lithospheric mantle are divided up, and they kind of float on this asthenos, uh, this weak, this plasticky mantle. And, and since it's asthenos, since it is able to move as a fluid, what does it do? What's the verb that it do? Um, since, it, since this asthenosphere is materially weak, since it's plastic, since it's liquid, since it behaves almost like a liquid, what does it do? What verb does it do? Yeah, it convects. Yeah. I'm drawing what are convection currents, or what's supposed to be convection currents here. And the convection of the mantle, just like boiling in a water, um, boiling in a water, a boiling pot of water uh, causes this circular motion. And this circular motion then drives the motion of plates. So if we have this convection current here, drives this plate this way. And this convection current here, drives this plate this way. And what's driving these convection currents at all? What fundamental property of the universe is driving the convection currents? Heat. Yeah, the fact that the, the Earth is hot on the inside. And it's hot on the inside because of two things. Because of uh, the residual heat let over, left over from the gravitational collapse of Earth. So from when Earth accreted uh, in the void, when it started to collapse under gravitational force, the heat left over from that process still contributes heat to convection and also the decay of radioactive elements causes heat uh, which causes convection as well. Do you have questions? There's obviously more to it than this. I'm going to trust you to learn about the different kinds of plate movement, convergent, divergent, etc. Um, there's different, um, we have to talk about oceanic and uh, continental crust. We have to talk about basaltic and granitic magma, but all of those things are in your book. And we've also talked about the basaltic and granitic magma before with igneous rocks. But do you have other specific questions? Bye.